A Brownian ratchet is any device that can harvest energy from Brownian motion, that is, random thermal motion such as the motion of air particles in a room. In the 1960s, Richard Feynman, the famous Nobel laureate and bongo player, argued that Brownian ratchets were impossible, and for 60 years, no one questioned that argument. After all, doing useful work requires some differential, a transfer from hot to cold or high to low. Surely when everything is in thermal equilibrium, even if there is energy there in the form of heat, that energy is static. Yet a team in Arkansas has slowly been working to get around the laws of thermodynamics and extract small amounts of energy from ambient temperatures using the thermal properties of a relatively new substance, graphene. The response from the scientific community has been muted so far, but funding sources and the media are interested. Can we produce power from essentially nothing but jiggling molecules? Was Feynman wrong? The first law of thermodynamics indeed, says that the change in the energy of a system is the heat added minus the work done. The second law meanwhile says that for a closed system, entropy must always increase. The second law was derived from Sadi Carnot's studies of steam engines, a good example of when technology precedes science. Carnot wanted to understand how these engines made things go. At the time, the dominant theory for how such engines worked was called the caloric theory. The 18th century scientist Lavoisier promoted the caloric theory as a means to explain why fluids change volume when heated or cooled. He argued that a subtle fluid filled the spaces between the molecules when the fluid was heated. Much like the ether of the late 19th century that Einstein disproved, this theory proposed the existence of a fluid where none was required. Molecules move apart when heated, generally because they are moving faster and have more entropy. Carnot, nevertheless, made a huge impact on the future of science when he invented a thought experiment, the Carnot engine. This theoretical engine consists of two reservoirs of heat which he thought of as containing different amounts of caloric. Carnot's engine operates by something now called the Carnot cycle, which shows that the work done by such an engine relates to the temperature difference times the ratio of heat transferred and the hot reservoir temperature. Carnot's engine can also be reversed. Mechanical work can transfer energy from a cold reservoir to a hot one. Prussian scientist Rudolf Clausius, among others in the 19th century, used Carnot's theory to derive a form of what we now call the second law of thermodynamics. Heat can never pass from a colder to a warmer body without some other change connected therewith occurring at the same time. Clausius, 1854. This seems obvious. Heat passes from hot to cold, never in reverse unless there is something else like a compressor forcing the change. This also means that if two regions are at the same temperature then no work can be done by the flow of energy from one to the other. Now we know that there is no such thing as heat in the sense of a fluid like caloric. Heat is simply a property that molecules carry. Indeed when you have a small number of molecules it is impossible to say how much heat they carry. They have energy for sure. But concepts like temperature, pressure and so on that we typically want to quantify when we talk about heat are ill-defined with small sample sizes. All this became mathematically precise with the work of Ludwig Boltzmann, Gibbs and others who developed statistical mechanics in the late 19th century, building on thermodynamics. Statistical mechanics connected the Newtonian mechanics of individual particles or molecules of gases and fluids to thermodynamic concepts like temperature, entropy, pressure, specific heat and so on. This theory showed that thermodynamics was the result of the law of large numbers. The more molecules you had, the more true the laws were. Since most everyday applications involve trillions of trillions of molecules, these laws are very true. But with that development, it seemed like there was an opening to defy the so-called laws of thermodynamics. If they were, after all, only statistical and not absolute, surely they could be violated at small scales? Enter the Brownian ratchet. We all know what a ratchet is. It is a device that can turn one way, but not the other. Imagine how a ratchet might be used to collect energy from some chaotic source like ocean waves. A turbine is connected to a ratchet such that when a wave comes in, the turbine turns raising a heavy weight a little bit. This is more or less how a Brownian ratchet works except that instead of being hit by waves, the turbine is hit by individual molecules that are in thermal equilibrium. Now if the turbine were very large, this would have no effect because the number of molecules hitting the turbine from one side would be the same as from the other, and it wouldn't move. But suppose the turbine is so tiny that a molecule only hits it once in a while. In that case the turbine could be set up so that it only turns when molecules hit it on one side but not the other, and thus collect energy to do useful work, in violation of Clausius and the second law of thermodynamics. 
It was exactly this setup that Feynman argued was impossible in the 1960s. You can read his argument here. Essentially, Feynman argues that the random motion of the molecules hitting the device would transfer to the device itself, causing it to fail to ratchet properly and unwind. Ratchets, he argues, depend on more predictable motion to work. The ratchet and Powell proposed by Feynman. A set of veins in T1 turns when molecules strike it. This causes a ratchet in T2 to turn which does work by turning a pulley attached to a weight in the middle. This makes sense because all ratchets are leaky, meaning they aren't perfect and can turn against their natural direction, and thermodynamics exploits that leakiness to maintain thermal equilibrium. Meanwhile, if we do manage to lock down our ratchet, we still have a problem because all storage mechanics can transfer energy in two directions in two ways, work or heat. That means that whatever storage mechanism I use, such as the pulley attached to a weight that Feynman proposes, can transfer energy back to the ratchet to undo itself. And that is exactly what happens. The key to getting around Feynman's argument, it turns out, is to look at systems that approach thermal equilibrium very slowly. In other words, we want to delay as long as possible the time when the storage mechanism loses the work it has stored up, because we know it will eventually happen. This is important because it provides enough time to separate the storage mechanism from the ratchet before the stored energy is released back to the ratchet. Then the energy can presumably be used without risk. The Arkansas team showed this in a theoretical model in 2023 as part of their work, which has now been funded by a $900K grant, that their system might be able to power devices, such as sensors, that can run on very small amounts of power. Their system used diodes and capacitors instead of ratchets and poles. The way they slowed down the equilibrium, however, was to connect them in opposition to one another in a parallel circuit. You can think of this as having two ratchets and poles and two pulleys. Each is attached to a separate vein inside T1 above. The ratchets are set up so that they turn in the opposite direction so each has the opportunity to catch energy that leaks out of the other one. As one pulley leaks energy back to its ratchet, which then pushes it back into the fluid, that energy can be picked up by the other ratchet and vice versa, since they are set in opposition. This won't stave off equilibrium forever. Eventually, unless the amount of energy stored in the pulleys is infinite, they will settle to nothing. Yet the convergence is slow enough that the pulley can be disconnected from the ratchet before it loses its energy and used. This miraculously does not violate the second law of thermodynamics because the slow convergence to equilibrium means that equilibrium thermodynamics temporarily doesn't apply. Instead we are in the realm of non-equilibrium thermodynamics for a very brief moment. All this is made possible by the thermal properties of graphene of course, which is the vein in Feynman's Brownian ratchet. This is pretty cool stuff but far from the boasts in the media that this will generate limitless energy or that it is harvesting zero-point energy somehow, neither of these is true. The graphene fluctuations are merely thermal, and the amount of power collected is so tiny in the nanowatts or billionths of a watt that it is hard to imagine this would serve our energy needs well. At best, this could create small self-powering circuits for sensors, which generally require very little power. This would be exceptionally useful for monitoring very remote areas that do not have natural sources of energy, such as other planets far from the sun or underground, as well as under the ocean. Also, it could be useful for biotechnology placed inside the body since many of these devices now require batteries. I look forward to seeing Thibado and team turn out a working product in the next few years.